All right. So we should be recording now. So welcome everyone. I'm Emily Flynn, the Director of Health and Wellness for the City of Kingston. And this is the Live Well Kingston Commission meeting. And um, let's do a round of introductions. So uh, your name, any affiliation that you'd like to say, your pronouns would be great. And how about um, a quick response to how a rainy day makes you feel? So today I've been feeling kind of uh, sleepy, but I saw some lightning and that kind of woke me back up again. And I'm gonna pass it to someone. So Eli, do you mind introducing yourself next and then pass it on? Oh, she, her, sorry. I'm, I'm Eli Duker. As I mentioned just a bit ago, I am transgender, but I do go by he and him pronouns. Um, I <clears throat> am an environmental microbiologist and I work at Bard College and I, um, I think that thunderstorms uh, were my screen time when I lived in the Midwest. Um, you could you never disappointed uh, with thunderstorms is my favorite thing in all the world. So I'm pretty happy. Would you like me to pass for you, Eli? No worries. Sorry, I that, that is okay, Teresa. Thank you. As a fellow Midwesterner, I totally relate. I am Teresa Widman, she, her pronouns, and I am here on behalf of Heal Well Kingston. I am the uh, focus team chair. I don't know why, that's what I am, right, Emily? And uh, it's good to be here. Nice to see everyone. And I will pass it to Troy Ellen. Thank you, I'm Troy Ellen Dixon. I'm the chair of Live Well Kingston, and my pronouns are she, her. And the thing that rainy days always reminds me of these days is it somehow harkens back to when I was a child going to elementary school and walking in the rain. And at the time with the rain hat and the slicker and the boots and everything. And I guess that means I'm getting very old because I'm starting to reminisce about my childhood. <laughs> Don't judge me. <laughs> and I will pass it along to Stacy. Okay, hello. I'm Stacy Kraft with the Ulster County Department of Health and Mental Health. And I go by pronouns she and her. And rainy days make me feel very tired and um, just chilly. <laughs> very, you know, just, I'm in my big fuzzy fleece, so I'm trying to stay warm, but drinking lots of caffeine. Excited to be here though, thank you. And I'll pass it to Malia. Hey Stacy, um, Malia Dumont, I'm a Live Well Kingston Commissioner. Um, I think this is the first time I've had a meeting with Eli that's not at Bard, right? Uh, so this is really fun. Um, yeah, I, I grew up in Tornado Alley in Oklahoma and uh, um, just always found storms really exciting. Uh, so, but now I'm thinking about all the plants I put into my garden this week and I'm really happy they're getting lost spring. I will, uh, sorry, I was a few minutes late. So, um, do, do, okay, uh, I don't think we, I, we missed. Anyone? Uh, Lorraine, maybe next? Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, Lorraine Farina, uh, she and her. And uh, I am uh, the chair of the Conservation Advisory Council Air Quality Subcommittee for the city of Kingston. And I spoke to this group uh, a little over a year ago in February. Um, there seem to be different faces, so I'm happy to see, <laughs> I believe, different faces than the ones I saw a year ago. Some familiar ones, so hello to you all. Um, and I was talking to you about the air quality in Kingston and particularly about wood smoke pollution and the science that, uh, that is available regarding that. Um, and since that time, uh, I passed along to Emily some information about what we've been up to since then. We have formed a partnership with Bard College. Um, Dr. Duker uh, and colleagues uh, have been uh, working with us to monitor the air quality in the city of Kingston. Hey, Lorraine. Um, and uh, 
Lorraine, yes. can, I, can, can I just you pause you? Me? Yes, I can. I just want to do introductions and then we're going to go more into the, you can tell us oh, more about that. Sure. sure. So rainy day, I'm looking forward to the lilacs. That's what it makes me think of. <laughs> it's watering my lilacs. I'll pass it along to Doug. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Doug Coop, and I am uh, a member of the Kingston Common Council, uh, representing Ward 2, which is uh, the uptown area. And my position here as a, as a guest, technically, is to, to serve as a liaison to any thing that you might need from the council. So I, I, I listen and uh, if you need something needs to be brought to the council, you're looking for something, a resolution or communication or something, you know, I'm the guy that will help you do it. Uh, today in my neighborhood was a very special day. Uh, since the pandemic started over one year ago, uh, a group of people have gotten together every single day that's over 400 days now at 12 noon for a neighborhood sing. And we gather for about five to 10 minutes and somebody downloads a, a song and we have a, a, little, a little mini PA system and we sing and we sing all kinds of songs and uh, we greet each other and talk about what's going on. And today the people that host have been hosting it for a year Bill and Kathleen Keenan were, it was their, their 50th wedding anniversary. So we had a little party today, but it's been a, a really nice, warm neighborhood event. I don't know how something like this could be sustained, but it's, we're gonna end it on May 1st. So it's a good day. Thank you, Doug. Um, maybe Heidi, have you had a chance to go yet? Oops, sorry, I have not. Hello, Doug, um, what did you sing to them for their 50th wedding anniversary? You know, it was a song I never heard of. <laughs> <laughs> they, they picked a song, but it, it, it was something that goes back to 20, oh, long, 50 years. And I did not know the song, I'm embarrassed to say. So I just sort of mummed along and faked it pretty well, I guess. But I ate the cupcakes. <laughs> Awesome. Um, I'm Heidi Kirshner. I'm uh, with the YMCA of Kingston and Ulster County. Pronouns are she and her. Um, and rainy days, you know, April showers bring May flowers. But uh, I remember as well sitting in, you know, school and elementary school and seeing the rain coming down and just knowing that you're not going out at lunchtime, you're not going to go out at recess and you got to walk home in the rain. Um, wasn't all that pleasant of memory. So, you know, I look forward to sunshine. Uh, Heidi, uh, here's the song. It, it, it was uh, <laughs> From a Distance by Beth Midler. Oh! Circa, everybody's shaking their head. They know it. I must be really out of it. I never heard of it. You know? <laughs> if it's not by Bach, Beethoven, or Handel, you know, <laughs> I'm kind of lost. <laughs> okay. But it went over well. Yeah, everybody wants a copy. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, did we miss anyone? I, Stacy, did you go yet? Did I miss it? You went. Okay, great. Uh, did everyone else get a chance to go? I think so. Okay, fabulous. Um, if it's all right with the commissioners, I'm going to move the meeting minutes to a little bit later to try to get um, the air quality in, and then Teresa, and so Teresa can get out by five. Uh, if that's all right with everybody. Great, then let's go into Lorraine and Dr. Eli. So um, Lorraine, you started to um, kind of queue up a little bit of uh, the history. Do you want to pick that up? And sorry for me, uh, you know, no, please no, forgive me for kind of interrupting. Yeah, but take it that's away fine. again. Uh, I don't have a whole lot more to say except that um, I understood that there were some questions on the part of the commissioners and that's why we were invited here by Emily today. So uh, that's where I'll leave that. Um, and I will pass the mic to, I hope you can hear me. I'm, can you hear me? I hope. Are we you can. able to hear me? 
We, yeah, we heard you. It was kind of getting a little pixelated. Yes. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, I'll just pass the mic to um, Eli, Dr. Duker, who can explain a little more about the air quality monitoring that's been going on so far, and maybe then take your questions if that sounds good. So, Ray, is, is it possible for me to uh, share the screen? You should be able to now. Okay. All right. One second. Hey, okay. I think I'm just hearing Doug's birds. Oh, he muted. Okay, never mind. Go ahead. Well, that's what that was. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, hi, everyone. I am a professor. So, of course, I brought way too much to talk about. So, I'm just going to talk about a little bit and then I'm going to stop and see what folks want to talk about um, and, and the questions that you have. But um, I just want to give a little background. Uh, the um, so Bard College uh, is uh, my, who pays me, and um, I'm an environmental microbiologist there. But what I focus on is the connection between water quality and air quality, and how what's in the water ends up in the air, which means that by accident I've also become um, an expert on air quality. And uh, then I've I've been um, conducting classes, and my classes are um, often, if not always, uh, built on the fact that students are learning science about air quality and water quality that can easily be translated immediately into helpful service for communities around us. And so trying to figure out how do we share our tools at BARD in, in the academic arena with the communities that we are part of, acting as community members instead of just institutions on the Hill. And so what I, um, I started a class with a, a group of students who wanted to learn about air quality and it didn't take long for us to connect with Lorraine Farina. And, um, and ever since then, we've been building uh, a partnership between the Kingston CAC and um, our air quality work at BARD, which is uh, operating under the Center for the Study of Land, Air and Water, which is pretty much study of everything. But anyway, um, the air quality piece um, has become a, a real uh, strong point for us actually over the last couple of years. And about a year ago, we installed, well, no, a year and I guess three months now, we installed um, one of our air quality sensors on the roof of Andy Murphy building. And uh, in partnership with CAC and Lorraine's um, subcommittee and uh, started what we're calling the Kingston Air Quality Initiative. So that's the partnership between uh, our community science lab, which is where all the science that's connected to community happens at BARD um, with uh, Kingston CAC around air quality. And uh, about, uh, I guess about a month or so ago, we, we um, had our second press release about, um, about the project and we shared data from that project. Um, and I wanted to uh, look at some of that, those data here with you. So we um, so we installed the we, we installed the air quality sensor on the Andy Murphy building. We let it run for a year and some, which is important because you can't really say much about the air quality of a community if you only have a couple of days. You need a full year to take a look at what's really happening um, in air quality. Um, also, it just so happened to be two or three months be, uh, um, before the pandemic shut down. So we also, um, it's an interesting study and that we continue to, um, that we continue to uh, look at, which is the difference between when there was the um, full shutdown and now as classes are starting again for students and things are picking up, we're, we're able to take a look at, you know, how has our community changed in terms of our contributions to air quality um, and what what might it look like if we all stopped using cars at, at one point? I mean, as a as a scientist, this is an amazing natural experiment for me um, because I, there's no way I could ask all of Kingston to stop driving all of a sudden. I can imagine the response that I would get. Um, the pandemic actually made that happen. And I don't want to make light of the seriousness of the pandemic or how it's devastated all of us and, um, and particularly families who have lost people. But it has provided um, an interesting uh, uh, moment in this data set that we've collected. So we, um, we uh, have published some of the results here 
on the, the CAC website. And we also um, have more information and more detail about air quality on the center's website. Um, but what the, the big findings are is that um, we do have, so this, uh, this figure right here, basically showing over time, what um, are the levels of the um, particulates that are in the air um, that cause us harm? What are those levels over time? And this yellow bar up here denotes where the EPA says uh, it's really bad and it needs to be addressed. Um, and so as, you, as you'll notice, most of our air quality, um, the air quality by day is below that threshold, which is 35 micrograms per meters cubed. However, there are many times throughout the year where we do have elevated uh, aerosols, uh, PM 2.5 in our air. And it is, uh, you know, those are things that we need to pay attention to. Um, it's also worth noting, and Lorraine will probably talk about this more in a bit, that the, uh, the regulations that the EPA has are across the nation just a backstop. They're actually the very least you can do. Um, most states actually choose to have uh, to um, put stronger thresholds in place. Um, and but air quality has been something that has taken states a longer time to get a handle on. And so if you were to take the 35 micrograms per meters cubed um, threshold that we have right here and take that into the international realm, you would find that um, actually the thresholds that in, in, on the international arena and, and by the World Health Organization itself, the thresholds that they use are far less and are kind of more in this region. And then we're seeing actually, actually there are a lot of days where we as a community, our, our uh, PM 2.5 levels would be deemed dangerous on an international level. So, um, so that is the first um, finding that we have. Um, and I think, Actually, what it tells us is that there's not a lot of bad air coming from other places. Um, and so if we look more at these, these other figures, um, and I can go into detail on these if you like, but, um, but in particular, when we look at times when there are inversions, so temperature inversions, so we're in a valley, as you know, and when you're in a valley and you're surrounded by beautiful mountains like we are, uh, you've constantly got cold air that's kind of sliding off of the mountains and into the basin where the river is. And the river itself is also cold. And so what you create is called um, very quickly is called an inversion, which basically means that in the atmosphere, normally as you go up, temperature goes down. Common sense, right? If you hike up a mountain, it gets colder as you get up there, right? Um, but when an inversion happens, the opposite is true. And so when we've got this cold air coming down from the mountains and in the river, uh, from the river itself, we end up with cold air and warmer air over the top. And that is called a temperature inversion because it's flipped. And what that means is that we do not get the, so when we are burning things, so if we're heating our house, um, we're having an outside campfire, we're using natural gas, coal or oil, those, um, all of those things rely on burning. And we rely on the, um, the atmosphere being arranged in such a way that the smoke goes up. And when there's a temperature inversion, unfortunately, the smoke goes sideways and does not leave the valley. And so we are, um, as a group, looking more into detail at how many times do we have temperature inversions and this is, a, this is a figure demonstrating how particulate matter, this is before the inversion, this is after the inversion, just how our local production of particulate matter does quickly build up and can become dangerous. So these are the things that we've been looking at. We also looked at the, how you can see uh, fireworks in the data set, which is really cool, I think. Um, uh, not, not necessarily cause for concern, but it means you know we as a community, we control our air. And so we have big decisions to make um, as we move forward. Climate change is about air and it's about water, those two things. Um, and it's about them behaving in ways that we did not predict and we did not build our buildings to predict or to, to withstand and also that our bodies aren't able to deal with. And so as things with air and water change, we need to be on top of that. And I think, um, think looking at air quality in a place like Kingston um, is, 
is a nice place to start. And I'm really excited to participate and continuing to preserve the good air quality that we've recorded here um, and uh, kind of heed the warning, systems, uh, warning um, signs that we're seeing in some of the data. Is that helpful? Okay. This is great. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So um, what it's, it's important to note too is that the measurements that we've made so far were from the roof of the Andy Murphy building. No one lives up there, as far as I know. So uh, none of us live up there. So the other thing that we've been doing is um, trying to put together uh, a, a, a research plan and funds around that to expand our uh, monitoring throughout uh, Kingston to look at uh, air quality on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis. Because one of the things that we've discovered and has been pretty elevated in terms of our understanding um, is that not all people breathe the same air. Um, we do not actually um, across this city or across the nation enjoy the same access to clean air as the people beside us. Um, all of us have, we work in different places, we live in different places, we are outside in different places. Um, and so all of us are exposed to uh, a big hodgepodge of different air, right? And what we learned with COVID um, is something that uh, was not a surprise to many, which is that folks who are exposed to chronic bad air, um, they died and continue to die from COVID much more quickly. I think it's really important to think about that because often when I was thinking about air quality before I started this work, when I would think about air quality, I'd be like, oh, that's an issue in India um, where they, you know, they don't, they don't have gas, so they, they're using wood smoke and you know, that's an issue there. Actually, it's an issue here in the United States and it's an issue in Kingston. There are decisions that we can make um, about our own health and the health of our neighbors um, that really could uh, change our relationship to air. The thing is we've done most of the science around it. Um, the, my contribution is just to bring the fancy equipment and the capacity to understand what the heck it's saying, but uh, the science has been done. Um, now it's time for um, uh, us to figure out based on how we care about each other and also um, how we want to be a truly sustainable city moving forward and how we want to listen to science um, and use those tools uh, to, to make those decisions. Pause in there, Elon. Yeah, so if there are any questions or directions you'd like me to take it, and Lorraine, you should definitely jump in. So I just want, hi, I'm Stacy with hi, the health Stacey. department. Hi. I'm super excited about all this. Um, the American Lung Association just put out their state of the air report. And I was disappointed that Ulster County didn't have um, monitoring data to mm. be able to get a grade mm -hmm. um, this year. But, um, you know, sometimes we have had them and I, you know, like to track all of the data as understanding, you know, the health of our community. And so this is just fantastic that something local is happening. Um, I love that the, monitoring tool is in Kingston um, and that there's plans for expansion. And I wonder um, how long will the study be done? Is it gonna um, be another few years guaranteed or is this undetermined? Well, um, it's, uh, you know, it started with uh, one of my sensors that I've had since graduate school, like the nearest and dearest sensor to my heart. Um, and uh, it kind of started acting weird a couple of months ago. So we've now replaced it with something much more fancy. So we ended up getting the funding for that. And as far as I'm concerned, that's a permanent installation. As mm -hmm. long as the city will let us have it there, I don't see any reason why um, Bard would suddenly not be interested in um, air quality in the Hudson Valley. Um, and uh, we are building at Bard. So I'm excited about it, right? But you know, it's, uh, it's just me, right? But what we've done is taken that excitement and that interest, and we've um, created a whole group of people at Bard, many of whom actually live in Kingston. Um, who are lab techs and professors and um, directors of labs 
um, that are dedicated to this work. So it's become something much bigger than just me and Lorraine, which is awesome. And, um, and we have every intention to continue it as long as uh, we can, as long as there's electricity um, and as long as our sensor makes it, this one should make it a lot longer, hopefully at least 10 years. In terms of expanding, um, we do have limited capacity around that. Um, and I think it's likely what we'll do is choose another couple of permanent installations, if possible, and then try some sort of mobile solution where we can take uh, sensors and maybe have them in someone's backyard for a bit. Or, or we hear that one neighborhood is having some issues and we go in there for a couple of months or something like that. Uh, um, the thing that would limit us, I mean, the thing that always limits us, right, is time and energy. Um, I do think we've got, um, for now, we've got a good source of funding for at least two years or so, which is connected with the international work that BARD has been doing. So it's interesting because I gave a very similar talk this morning to folks in Bangladesh, um, in Hungary, um, in uh, uh, where else? Oh, Taiwan, um, because we're, we're working with folks who are working with communities there as well. And our dream is to hook up these communities. So folks from Kingston CAC could be talking to folks in other countries who are dealing with the same issues and trying to figure out, okay, what do we do? You know, how do we deal with this? Climate is a global issue. So the that's a long answer, but the short answer is it's there until Kingston says no more, I think. Thank you, you know, that's exciting. Yeah, and I would love to know, learn about how to uh, somehow participate in getting Kingston on the map in terms of uh, monitoring data. So it might be good to talk about that. Dr. Ducker, how, how that device you have, um, how much, I, I guess, what's the radius or the distance that it measures? Uh, so it measures what's right there around it. Um, so the measurements that you're seeing would be, uh, so to think about it on a personal level, you'd have to be standing right beside our sensor to be breathing the air that it's showing us. Um, but what you can also, there's another way of thinking about it, which is that air moves constantly. So we have winds um, and uh, fronts that come in. So the atmosphere is constantly moving. You've got um, stuff coming up from the street, right? Um, you've got stuff coming in from the mountains. It's such a beautiful view up there. Um, and uh, so, so that's a question that I could never answer, actually, because because uh, the wind, the air that it's measuring some days could be all the way from um, New York City. Uh, mm. You know, you just never know. It depends on where the wind is coming from. But in terms of coverage for the city, uh, what I can say is it, it's uh, way more than most other um, uh, cities in the Hudson Valley have because there aren't many cities who have any sort of monitoring. The data that you see, um, that is used by the EPA and other um, agencies to uh, discuss or characterize our air are based on models. And it's modeling from over 40, sometimes 50 miles away. Um, so the, the assumptions are that the air is well mixed, but we know that that's not true and that the local is really actually very important um, when we're thinking about this long-term. So like the, the fires that happened out on the West Coast, um, in the fall of last year, and some of the ash actually did make it across the United States. Yes. That's going to pick that up. Well, actually, oh my God, I'm so glad you asked that. I have a senior who's been studying that for the past year. And so she's getting ready to um, provide a report. So I'll make sure that goes out uh, publicly because she wanted to know were we affected? Would we see that on the monitors? And the answer is yes and no. Um, uh, the air, the air that had that uh, smoke uh, was higher than our sensors. It was so it's not uh, it's not as easy as you would think, and it also did not affect our air quality as much as you would think. So it's an interesting okay. it's an interesting finding. However, the other side of this is that rain that happened um, in, uh, during that time absolutely contained particles from that um, from that. Uh, um, from those fires. And so that's where you would see the ash and that kind of thing falling out. Okay. Yeah. And then one last question, because I don't want to hog your time, but this is really so interesting. You had the EPA standards and you talked about the, you know, more world global standards. Is China included in those global standards? 
Well, uh, the, this is all the UN, right? And so, uh -huh. that, you know, it's kind of uh, good actors and bad actors kind of thing, uh, which the US is one or the other, depending on the day. So I'm not trying to single out China at all. Uh -huh. um, but the World Health Organization is a, a strong suggestion. Um, it is, a, um, and I, I, as a scientist, I respect these um, international um, gatherings of scientists because I think that's our best that's our best knowledge, right? So, um, so uh, but what I do know, what I can tell you about China is that they have been dealing with their air quality issues because they have to. Um, they, they, they were, they've been faced with, uh, you know, they're killing their citizens. Mm. But I think in the United States, we are too, um, but uh, we haven't actually been so good at making the connections between why people are dying. Air somehow is the thing that we interact with most intimately as, as um, animals, and somehow we think about it the least. So. Hmm. Uh, Trayon, you got your hand up? Yes, I do. When you, um, Eli, when you made that uh, comment about people with COVID, you know, because they're breathing worse air, they yes. were more likely to succumb to COVID as a result of that. And I know very little about this, but one of the things that I was thinking about is it's around, I, I learned this recently, sort of, they call it the, I think the urban heat effect, which is because mm -hmm. low income neighborhoods, neighborhoods where blacks and people of color live oftentimes do not have trees and green spaces yeah. and things like that. But I'm expecting that the tr lack of dream trees and shrubs and green spaces also has an impact on air quality, correct? Absolutely. So Absolutely. it's not it's not cleansing the air, so to yeah. speak. Um, and and th so the question I have is between the external, you know, the air that's outside, and also the fact that there's an internal in in homes where the air quality isn't good for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so my question is, it, can we monitor internal air quality also to, to kind of get an idea of what the balance is of being outside versus being indoors where you think you're safe? Absolutely. Uh, so some of the, some of the reason why, reasons why I got into this work was that question. Um, uh, the work that we're doing is guided by some uh, some real uh, environmental justice pioneers in, uh, in California who are fence line communities who were being told by the likes of Chevron that if they sheltered in place, they would be safe from some pretty horrific uh, releases of toxic chemicals right in their neighborhoods. Um, the answer is the sheltering in place is not going to keep you safe. And, and so whatever the air quality is outside absolutely will affect the air quality inside. And the other part of this is that um, uh, inside air quality sometimes can be horrible. One of the things that um, we, we want to be a part of looking at too is what is the indoor air quality for uh, certain neighborhoods in Kingston? Because there are connections and you really can't, uh, maybe you make measurements and nothing goes over 35 micrograms per meters cubed, but assuming that everyone lives outside all the time is not a safe assumption. And so you also have to look at what they're exposed to inside. Um, and that, you know, and that again is, a, um, there's a role for the city in those kinds of things because where people live, housing stock is a really important part of keeping a city going, right? So, um, so yes, yeah. so we, we have actually been um, doing some monitoring inside and some monitoring outside already, and we'd like to expand that work. And what I can tell you is that um, it's a little bit um, unsettling if you, the first time you get a sensor in your house to realize how high the levels get when you burn something in your cooking. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, we, uh, so, yes. Thank Does that you answer your question? Absolutely. Thank okay. you very much. And I'm probably going to, you know, Google some of what you said. And four hours later tonight, I'll have 40 tabs open because okay. that's how <laughs> I roll. 
but I really find this interesting. So thank you for and sharing. At that point, you should email me, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, great. Great. Heidi, do you still have your hand up or is that le left over? Do you have another question? I guess not. Any other questions or Lorraine, anything you want to add? We have about five more minutes. I yeah, I would like to just uh, say something Eli referred to briefly about the um, EPA numbers and um, the EPA thresholds that have been set and the 35 micrograms per meter squared. Um, it's there has been a lot of uh, a lot of academic. Uh, hey, Lorraine. Excuse me, Lorraine. Yeah. Work. I was wondering, recently, can you the... turn off your camera? Because it might be easier to hear you if you turn off your camera. You're very hard to hear. Good, good, good suggestion. I'll try it. Let's, Let's see. try that. Is that any better? Yeah. Yes. So start with the EPA okay. 35 done. micrograms per meter cube. Okay. So, um, yeah, so there has been a lot of uh, scholarly writing recently about how um, there, there's a panel that the Clean Air Act mandated many years ago, the Clean Air Act of the United States, um, that mandated a scientific committee be impaneled every few years to study just this question of uh, what kind of thresholds would make uh, make for a safe level for people, people's exposure to particulate matter 2.5, the size of tiny particulates that is um, in particular in wood smoke pollution. Uh, so um, in many other things too, but at very high levels in wood smoke pollution. So uh, during the Trump administration, there was a very illustrious panel that had been put together, in fact, much more robust than the normal ones had been with many more scientists. And they were in the process of submitting their report when they were summarily dismissed and disbanded by the Trump administration in 2016. So they did go forward with their research and they, they published the results in 2019. And what that shows is that there is no safe level. And that is what the World Health Organization basically concludes as well. Just as there is no safe level of exposure to people for people to lead, there is no safe level for exposure to PM 2.5 because it is so dangerous to human health and cause premature death on the very day of exposure among myriad other serious, serious health conditions. So I just wanted to mention um, mentioned that, that health, as, as uh, Eli referred to as well, that I think it's, it behooves us to really begin to think or continue to think, if we're thinking that way, that the environment is our health. Um, this, they, they are certainly intertwined in most in some way. Uh, so that's, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Lorraine, can I ask a clarifying question? The PM25, uh, is that fire sp firewood smoke? PM2.5 is a uh, particulate matter of the size one thirtieth of the diameter of a human hair. Um, and they that particulate matter, that tiny bit of uh, particle, uh, is, is released mainly through combustion. Um, the, the issue with wood smoke when, it, when wood is burned is that it produces uh, tremendous volumes of this, more so than coal, uh, much more harmful. And in fact, um, it, it's, it produces black carbon, which is what we commonly think of as soot, um, which is also a powerful climate force or um, mm -hmm. Arctic responsible for our ice melt. But as far as our day-to-day -day lives go, it's something that no one in lung association, as I, I know Stacey is well aware, um, certainly has stated and seems to state that um, it's not safe for anybody to be breathing um, wood smoke, not just sensitive groups. Does that it's answer, Emily? 
So Eli, Emily, you that, that is what we are measuring in this upper left hand corner here. That's PM 2.5 level. Yeah. And so wood smoke is a major contributor, particularly in the Hudson Valley. We like our we like our campfires. We like our fires in our houses. Um, and that's all nice and good, except that uh, we're actually uh, participating in uh, degrading our own air quality, something that we need to ask ourselves about. Um, as I continue to mourn the, the science, I cannot change the science. Um, and that's just reality. So as people, we have to, we have to wrestle with that, right? I think one of the hardest things to think about, um, so when we're talking about air quality, one of the hardest things to kind of take in is that you know we do breathe bad air all the time and we are still walking around. Um, but I think what COVID, what the pandemic has demonstrated to us is that it is absolutely not a burden that is equally shared. And we are actually uh, very privileged to be able to live in an area where, uh, where um, air quality uh, is okay. Um, but if we don't pay close attention and work hard to maintain that, um, there's nothing stopping us from getting to a point where our air is very degraded. And on top of that, there are people all over uh, the United States and in Kingston that actually are breathing really bad air all the time. And so, um, and I, you know, so it's something you have to wrestle with, right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and, and some of us have uh, upbringings where, I mean, I don't know, I was like the master fire builder when I was at camp. Uh, I love fire. It is like why I go outside, um, you know, but uh, sometimes we're confronted with times when our culture is strangely not healthy for us. So, and that, you know, that's hard, but it doesn't mean we can't change things. I think we're gonna wrap it up there. That actually also kind of feels like a good last thought. We're gonna have some time to move on to heal well. Eli, Lorraine, I'm sure if people have further questions, can they reach out to you? Um, what, how, what method would you like them to reach out to you? I can just put my email in the chat right now if I can figure out how to get to the chat. <laughs> yeah, um, and I guess stop sharing your screen. There you go. Yeah, there you Perfect. Go. <laughs> okay. um, all and right. really, please email me with any questions you have. I, I love talking about this stuff. Yeah, and uh, for what it's worth, you can certainly get in touch with me too. I'll try to mine here. All right, so thank you for that. Thank you both for joining us in this discussion. Really appreciate your time. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you very much. And Eli, it was, it was good to meet you. I think one of the people that I, students I'm working with is gonna be in your program next year, Julia Gloninger. Oh, she's amazing. Yes, she'll be graduating. We're, we're sad to lose her, actually. I yes. know, but she's excellent. She's been doing a lot of work in the bar, in the Kingston community. So. Yes. Oh, no. I, I'm so glad to hear that. She's amazing. Yes. Anyway, we get to meet everyone. You. I hope to see you thank again. You, thank I... you, Lorraine. Thank you all. Okay. All right. Thank you, Lorraine. All right. Um, next up, let's do a little bit of a heal well report if we're ready for that. Um, Teresa, how do you feel about kicking that off? Yeah, I'll get us started. And you're here and Susanna's here. So when I have to leave in 10 minutes, you can keep it the ball going. Um, Emily shared the uh, the values, which was one of our projects that we worked on so far this year in our action plan. And so I'll just kind of do a cursory review of the action plan. We updated it in January. And um, one of the things that we had kind of discovered last year was the members of the focus team enjoyed having presentations from other organizations that are tangentially related to health healing, et cetera. And so we decided to continue with presentations this year. And we, you'll see in the action plan, the groups that we have listed. Um, thus far, we've heard from Caring Majority Rising and Rise Up Kingston this year. And uh, one of the things that's come up is how can we actually stay more connected to their work? 
and create more of a synergy to kind of strengthen the healing opportunities within Kingston. We haven't quite figured out what that looks like yet um, as, we're, as we're still kind of working through all of this and figuring out how to navigate it. But that is one of the things related to that, um, that part of our action plan that we are, are gonna continue to work on. Um, the second goal, building community awareness, I guess is something that we haven't done necessarily yet this year. Last year, we had done some public facing events to try to get the word out a little bit about Heal Well. Um, and one of the things we talked about, I don't even remember if it was at the whole meeting or if it was Emily and I, or Emily, Susanna and I, but we had talked about maybe trying to organize all of the focus teams to do kind of like a community event this summer where each one can kind of have like a pop-up little thing happening, which would then give us something really big to get more of the word out about all of what Live Well Kingston is doing. And so that is like very baby uh, stage of an idea. We haven't really flushed any of that out, but that is probably the most significant thing. Uh, we've also talked a little bit about trying to do a public facing event maybe in, in May or, or June, like a smaller thing, just heal well. Um, but we haven't started planning any of those things. And the idea being that if we can do a public facing event in a safe way, that it gives us an opportunity to use social media to get people excited about it, to keep pointing people to the work of Live Well and Heal Well. And our third goal was to identify our values. Um, a few of the members felt like it was important for us to kind of anchor into that very clear values. And so we worked on that. Um, I actually don't think that we've talked about it with everyone yet. We've, we've had longer presentations um, and we haven't gotten, Emily, Susanna and I kind of worked on the values. And so we haven't yet really fully presented it to the whole group, um, but it's something that we thought would help us really shape the, the, the purpose of why we're coming together, um, which has been a little amorphous. You know, it's, it's kind of changed over the years, depends on who shows up at the meetings, um, so there's, you know, it, it felt like a nice way to kind of root into something that felt meaningful for us. So that's something that we did do. And, um, and then the last thing on our action plan was related to the vaccines, which if I remember correctly, I, I think we kind of mostly tabled that because we felt as though it wasn't really within our purview to be doing that the many of the members of heal well are part of organizations that are administering vaccines and so people were often coming with that information that we could then share out to the community but we i think we felt that it wasn't really a, something that we were going to take an active role in as heal well um, so i'm not sure where we're where we stand right now with that um, that part of our action plan um, and I, that's kind of, I said that really quickly. I mean, I feel like that's pretty much the overview of where we're at right now. Um, Emily, Susanna, anything I'm missing that you want to add? Susanna, have any thoughts? Actually, oh. I don't think I was around that session around the values, honestly. I think I'm looking at that document for the first time because I know I missed a meeting. <laughs> Um, so, um, I just know you've helped out a lot. So I, as well, I was, yeah, not in that document though. Um, <laughs> I was like looking at those, oh, I like these. These are good. <laughs> um, I wish I could have said that was part of that, but, um, yeah, I think, yeah, no, I think, I think, um, I think what's hard or what's been challenging about Heal Well is um, in part is kind of figuring out who our target audience is. Like when we started this, and I think I'm looking at Melinda as being one of the original um, 
the original Live Well Kingston, um, you know, of the original Live Well Kingston group way, way back when, I don't know how many years ago now, where the focus of Live Well Kingston was on um, healthy, sort of uh, mostly like chronic diseases and, and um, you know, healthy eating and activity. And so when it came to the city and we had, we expanded the number of focus, um, focus teams um, and, and Keelwell stayed together there and we, you know, we engaged new members. Um, there was a lot of discussion for a long time about what the focus should be. And people, you know, were, most people were pretty clear that they didn't want to just keep it into that arena. And I think um, about, you know, chronic disease, act, uh, physical activity, um, et cetera. So I think, and, and from going from working more with like provider groups to just sort of everybody. And I think it's, it's made it a little bit challenging for us. And I, I'm, this is my opinion, um, uh, uh, Teresa and, and Emily, for us to come together to figure out, um, you know, it, to have a, a public facing activities. Like who are they for? Are they for the community? Are they for providers, you know, um, health and wellness providers? So um, anyway, I think that's just been a, a thing that we've been trying to figure out. Would, would you say that's true? true? I mean, I know we talked about it when I first joined. I remember us discussing who is this for. And I felt as though we kind of just organically moved in the direction of the public because we started, we focused heavily on the trauma campaigns, right? And, and trying to bring the screenings out to the public and get awareness out there Last year, we did a, you know, a couple of events, uh, public facing events that were meant for the public. I mean, to me personally, I feel like it, that it makes sense that we serve the public. I think most of the groups are doing that. And, and so to me, that's what makes sense. Um, but it's certainly not for me to decide. Uh, so that's, I, I, I kind of assumed that that's what we were doing was that we were focusing on the public. Um, Malia, you've got your hand up. Yeah, sorry. Um, my computer seems to be really slow in turning my mute button on and off. <laughs> um, yeah, this is great. I, uh, with regard to um, vaccines, as you mentioned, I, I wanted to say, so um, we've had great success at BARD in, in getting a lot of our community vaccinated, um, but we're also very cognizant of the fact that there are a lot of people who are vaccine hesitant um, on our campus and beyond our campus. So we pulled together a couple of different panels um, of uh, some of them um, focused, well, there, there are two, I'll just tell you about them briefly. And, and I, we have recordings of these that I'm happy to send along so they can be shared with the community. One is called to take the COVID-19 vaccine or not. Um, and that included one of the panelists was the lead immunologist at the vaccine center at the National Institute of Health. So she was like the person <laughs> who, and she's a young black woman. Um, so it, it, it was just very, very powerful. Um, and then the other uh, webinar we did was um, called the COVID-19 vaccine, unpacking the fears of communities of color and had some historians and sociologists on it, so we really tried to um, specifically and directly address um, some of the questions and concerns among people who are vaccine hesitant for a variety of reasons. And um, as I said, these these are recorded; they're a public resource. And um, I did send the links to um, Dr. Smith at the Ulster County Department of Health, um, but I'm happy to share them with others too if that might be helpful. Thank you, William. I saw um, some great videos by, um, was it Ryan? Ryan uh, yeah, Ryan, Ryan Dick responds. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. With I Marielle. Sure Thank you, Susanna. Yes. And with Marielle from La Vos was a part of it. Um, I also want to just pause because Teresa, do you need to jump? I Thank do. You. Thank you so much. I'm sorry I had this call. I didn't realize that I was at the end of the agenda, but it was good to see everyone. Thank you so much, Teresa. Tori Ellen, you got a hand up? Yes, because um, 
I'm just weighing in with my personal two cents. I think that focusing on community members is probably a good way to go, particularly since there are many in the Kingston community who do not have primary care providers. So therefore they're not getting information that way they need to be able to get the information more directly. So I think that that's an important consideration. Additionally, regarding the vaccine, I had my second dose last Friday and I had no reaction. I was already with, you know, Tylenol and homemade chicken broth and nothing, not even a headache. But, so I'm lucky. Yeah. But, when it, but when it comes to the vaccine, and I think, you know, churches in Kingston are doing this. They're doing a very good job early on, like in February, I know many of the churches and, and the black churches, black and brown churches, we're hosting vaccine clinics. I think if we can get the message from the pulpit, that is that is something that the community will respond to because they trust their clergy. And so I'm not saying whether you're doing that or not doing it, but I mean, if you are already doing it, that's the best way to get the information out. So, you know, thank you for saying that. I, I actually participate, and I'm just thinking something that maybe this group can do, but um, I was able to participate yesterday in the county's, um, Dan Proctor, who's the head of the county's effort to distribute the vaccine, they convened a, a meeting yesterday um, and it was all kinds of leaders from the county and um, Dr. Woodley from the Institute and I joined too, to talk about the fact that there's a lot of supply now a lot of vaccine supply in the county, but um, there's still big pockets of, of you know, and, and inequities, right, across the county of people not getting vaccinated. And so Dan Proctor was really, you know, was asking folks for ideas on how, how to do that and how to address this, this the inequities plus the, 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 those people who aren't getting vaccinated, even though it's, there's, there's all kinds of, the county's done all kinds of things, right? It's out in Shandaken yesterday, it's in, Ellenville, it's in all these different places. And, and so and people talked, had a lot of different ideas, you know, and a lot of different ideas about what's happening. If you look at the data nationally too, um, that, you know, I, I will say this just out front, that the, the data is showing that um, uh, really conservative Christian groups and Republicans are by far the, 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 the groups in, in terms of population groups, the least likely to get the vaccine. And then it can be broken down more granularly into like ethnicity, et cetera, too. And, um, and so, you know, a lot of people on the call and, and people, you know, different backgrounds talk, and, and actually Nina Dawson was on it. who talked a lot about churches, you know, one-on-one -on -one, um, education, really talking to family members, getting, you know, somebody like the family matriarch, you know, talked about doing PSAs and television spots with different groups of people who might um, um, represent have, you know, the, a group that was a doubting group and who changed their mind. And I talked about the fact that there's so much emphasis, I think in the media across the whole country on like on dying from COVID and not about the close to 30% of people who are having long-term effects from COVID. And we don't hear enough about that and get somebody, you know, in a, in a television ad and a PSA to talk about having lost their sense of smell or taste or neurological, long-term neurological damage from this. And that, that's, that, you know, that's, that's huge. So I think maybe this group, if we have any ideas also on what the county can do more specifically, and actually Troy Allen, Dan Proctor was asking specifically about what churches, like what churches could the county go to that they haven't gone to yet. Well, I, I don't know what, I don't know what church, I'm sorry to interrupt. No, yeah, I, I, no, I, no, I wasn't thinking. Okay. I'm, I don't know what churches they've already gone to, but you know, Point of Praise, for example, um, uh, New, New Progressive Baptist. I would also suggest, I can't remember the church right now that they're affiliated with, but the Ulster Immigrant Defense Network. No, they're doing one there. They're okay, going to do good. It. Thank you. There, yep. Actually, we did the institute did a, an outreach event at Holy Cross Church uh, last week, and we signed up just a handful of people because for vaccines. But um, because most people had been vaccinated already at La Misión, the Evangelical mm -hmm. Church in Midtown, because they did that, you know, that pop up there. 
But um, so, so the county's looking for help. You know, I actually talk more about the fact that there are a lot of people who have mistrust in government. So the county government being the ones to spread the word might not be, <laughs> they have to be a multifaceted approach and not just the county government. Well, that's why I was saying have the yeah. clergy. Yes have the clergy deliver the message. And another thing, and I know Melinda has her hand up, but before I forget, and another thing that I think is important is, I know they can't convey, the county cannot control which vaccine they get, but with some of these communities, it's gonna be harder to do a two dose vaccine, whether it's 21 days or 28 days. So, so even, even if you could get the one dose vaccine supply. Yeah. Well, you know, it was really interesting. Did anybody see that article in the Times last week about the country of Bhutan has one of the highest uh, vaccination rates in yeah. the world. It's an incredibly rural, rural mountainous yeah, uh, country. That. And they have like over 60% of their population vaccinated and they have dispersed community health workers and, and helicopters across mountains and into villages to vaccinate people. The difference there is that they've done this kind of stuff before. And I guess the country doesn't have such a mistrust in their healthcare system like Americans do in ours. And- Can, I wanna give Melinda a chance. Oh, sorry, sorry. No, 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 I just, sorry. So um, Suzanne, I just wanted to add to your conversation a little bit. Um, because you're looking for some ideas. I don't have good ideas on how to change people's minds who mistrust government. And, you know, we all know people or have family or friends that are in that boat. I don't think that's going to change until you can't get into a concert without your certificate or something like that. But the, I can say that there's still a group of people that are being missed. And they're being missed for the same reason that it's so successful in Bhutan. And that's that they don't really have the skill set to go online and sign up or to find out that there's extras or that sort of thing. And I can tell you this on so many different levels. Um, and I'll just give you a personal anecdote. We own an auto business. After my husband and I went up and got our second shot, which was up at Best Buy, um, that was through the village apothecary and they had a bunch of extras and we just came by the business was closed, but a lot of our mechanics were still hanging out. We popped in and say, Hey, if you want your vaccine, you could just go up there. This is how you do it. Three people went, they got their vaccine. And then the following week, people that they worked with realized they could do this and they went and did it. And I can also say that my, you know, I have family that work on, work for healthcare systems, work on computers, on insurance forms all day long, but were completely unaware that they could go through the county site and get an appointment. However, they, they, this person actually got my father an appointment at CVS long before I managed it, understood that, but did not understand that they could do it through government. So there's a lot of information um, missing. And there's also that idea that there's a whole group of people that just are not ever going to sign up online. I think the sign up uh, system is so limiting for so many people. So the idea that you could get in a van and just hit different businesses and say, hey, anybody here want one and travel through the county is a big idea. And, you know, I would say that your, you know, churches are a great place to start, but not everybody goes to church. So businesses and places of work are a really good place to start. To build on that, Melinda, because you make a very good point. It's true, not everybody goes to church. I don't go to church, but just about everybody in Kingston knows somebody who goes to church. So if the message you know, comes back to the neighborhood, it's like the old, it's the old shampoo commercial we, and yeah, they tell two great. friends and they tell two friends and so on and so on, so. No, I, I totally agree. I don't mean to negate that. I just mean it shouldn't be the only way that we're trying to reach people that might not be able to access a system to create, to, to nail an appointment. Well, and even to say there's extra parking spots. I've told people that so many times the county has extra parking spots. You go and you wait in it, you make a phone call. But it seems like such a hurdle for so many people that are already iffy about a vaccine 
But if it pops into their driveway or their place of work, I really think that that could be useful. And that's, you know, well, that's, I realize that's, a, that's a logistical hurdle for, you know, um, people to, to handle as well. But that has worked well for some things. Well, that's what I was thinking on in terms of the one dose vaccine, because that way you could literally have something that I know that there's all sorts of guidelines around vaccine distribution and all of that, but you know, like it's a pop-up at the corner of this and this, you know, when it's set up and people can come and get one dose outside. That's it. People passing by can get the one dose outside. I know that I'm making it sound much simpler than it really is, but if we want to meet the maximum amount, you know, reach the maximum amount of people, but we need to think about, I'm not talking about we, I'm talking about the royal we need to think about. Oh yeah, you know, you know, as the county mentioned, somebody mentioned, I thought it was a really good idea because, um, you know, I was saying it's like one of the things, because I've actually signed up a lot of immigrants in, mm -hmm. in, in Kingston, but in Rhinebeck and Red Hook, I speak Spanish and I volunteer a lot. So I've signed up a ton of people and arranged for rides and you know, in some institute practices or, or other places too, and trying to connect people with primary care because a lot of people don't even have, don't have doctors. But anyway, that's another story. But um, is, you know, is one of the things that I've said to a lot of to people um, is, you know, gosh, I can have my 85 year old mother now. She's over without worrying and she got to see her grandkids. And, you know, I might bring her back to her country where she's from and to, so she can see her sisters one last time and they can travel. And people is like, they start looking, you know, oh, wow, you know. So the county was saying, they are talking about maybe doing like a, a some kind of, you know, something around Mother's Day and Father's Day and tying it into, you know, you know, do something, you know, love your, love all the mothers in your life or something, you know, get, get vaccinated, see them safely. I, I thought that was a great idea, kind of make it a campaign. But, um, but yeah, and I think, you know, what you guys are saying too, is like, just, you know, every, if, if everybody could talk, talk to three people in their lives, trying to get, if everyone could just make a commitment to trying to get three to five people in their lives, in their workplaces or wherever connected to a vaccine, we'd be, we'd be in great shape. But and if you look, if you look at the, the, vac the map, I saw a map today at, and this other, vaccine meeting I attend for the Mid-Hudson region. If you look at Ulster County, Kingston's doing pretty well. So Kingston is, is pretty, pretty you know, has a high, large percentage of people who are vaccinated. But um, in the south, southern part of the county, Ellenville and that whole area, it's not good at all. And then further out west, it's not great either. So it looks like it's a, the more rural areas. And I'm sure that there are lots of inequities within the city and surrounding areas of Kingston too. But yeah, well, the vaccine isn't readily available when you get out to those more rural areas. So, you know, it's like you got to, I think the, the key is bringing the vaccine to the people. Yeah, yeah. And and I also think that a, the bigger problem is really just this whole having to go through that internet hurdle for yeah. so many people. It's yeah. just too hard for some people. I have heard everything from, I can't type that fast. You know, I mean, just stuff that it's just too big a hurdle. It's really surprising, but not surprising. So more of these well, walk-in walk -in clinics like they've done in Shandaken and Ellenville, just more walk-in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, they, and the state, um, not that people need to know or want to know all these gory details that I know about this stuff, but the state just um, removed the penalty of, they were, they were fining healthcare facilities or you know, provide dis, uh, distribution centers if they didn't use their vaccine within seven days, like up to $100,000, they removed that penalty. Effective, like today. Great. realizing Good. that there's more supply now than demand, so they're they've lessened that stress and that burden on on distributors. <laughs> Susanna, are you able to take, bring some of these thoughts back to the county for us, or should there be another process? I could write to Dan Proctor now that I I've met him. Sure, I'd be happy to. Yeah, I'm happy to bring it back. Emily, I work with him. Yeah, great, perfect. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, if it's all right with everyone, I'm gonna move us along a little bit. I have um, a few more things to mention in about 15 minutes left. 
So thank you all for that. Um, I'm gonna just put a little note for other feedback about Heal Well. Please let me know. We're still, we'd love some more feedback about how Heal Well is organized. But I'm gonna pause us on that for now. Um, I wanna move us on to a draft letter of support for the Ulster 2040 economic report. This is in response to Tim Wiedemann's presentation. Was that last month? Gosh, it feels like time is weird for me right now. Um, so I have a draft letter. Um, I'm not feeling particularly confident in it. So I'm, I think my ask for you all now is to take a look at this and send me, um, you can even um, in the Google document, change it to suggesting mode and give me edits and feedback that way. That's a great way to do it. Um, and then when we get this at a good spot, we can send this as a way to show our support for uh, the economic plan. Questions around that? Mm -mm. I'm going to add a deadline <laughs> next Friday. Can everybody get a chance to try to go into the document and let me know any feedback by next Friday? I'm going to close it up by then, and then we'll try to send it the week after. Emily, did Can you, you send this up by us? sending a link? Sure. Um, I'm putting it in the chat, and I'll, I can email it all to you. That's good. Sure. Let me make, just make a note of that. Okay. Any questions on that before I move on to the next one? All right. Um, so the next one is a letter that you, that Livewell Kingston signed on to. Here, I'll put the, I can um, put the link in the chat, but I, you know what, I'll share my screen also. Sorry about that. Feel free to always wave me down and ask me to share it if that works better for everybody. Uh, here, I'll share my screen. So, um, an email came through from, let me just make sure I get it correctly. What's the coalition called? Oh, it's not coming up. I think it's um, New York State Food Solutions. I'm not getting their name right. For Hunger Solutions. Thank you, Melinda. So Hunger Solutions was asking for people to sign on. Um, this is a letter urging um, free school lunches to continue um, the, um, let me see if I can remember. Uh, so um, as of right now, oh, I'm getting lost on my words here because I haven't read it in a week or two. I think the letter was to sign on to encourage um, free school lunches in, after COVID. And so um, I emailed Troy Ellen to, as chair to um, decide uh, if LiveWell wanted to sign on. And we had a quick discussion about it. And so Livewell did sign on to this letter. Um, and I'm not describing it very well. Questions before I continue? All right. What's, Emily, what's the extension they're looking for? Um, I mean, through next year? Yeah. You know, okay. Let me see. I'm trying to see it here. And forgive me for not having it at the top of my mind. No, that's OK. No. I would anticipate it's through 2022, I would think. Um, um, that's right. Okay, so they want to include it in the uh, Biden's infrastructure bill. So that is part of the urgency. Um, so they're um, arguing that food, it should also be considered part of um, infrastructure. And um, okay. We've heard from school districts that moving back to the tiered payment system after the waivers are lifted are likely to collapse their school meal programs that are already operating a deficit through the pandemic. So I think they're urging more support for the free schools, um, okay. free meals. And I don't see an, a timeline at this moment. Um, so that brought up a little bit, so let me stop sharing my screen. My last thought on that letter was that it brought up a little bit of a process question for the commission. Um, we had in the past had it that letters of support would be through the chair and um, the coordinator, myself, to approve to do. We haven't explicitly talked about other letters of support, not just, I'm sorry, letters of support for grants. So I wanted to just clarify with the commission a process about letters of support for other um, 
other other things um, to make sure that, that that process felt like a good process for the commission. Um, again, my uh, apologies. I'm, I feel like I'm not explaining it very clearly. I'm getting a little tired tonight. Any questions on that, on what I'm trying so when, to ask of you? What, when you say letters of support, that would be like um, folks who are going out and looking for a grant often go to organizations for letter of support for for their grants. Is that asking LiveWell to write a letter of support for a grant to be done? So that process is the one that we have. So for okay. a grant for a letter of support, we the, the commission in the past has already done a motion to accept that the coordinator and the chair can decide okay. what are the appropriate grants, as long as they're kind of within our mission. Mm -hmm. What I'm asking more is it, um, an expansion of that letter of support. So if the so here's a real here's a real example, the Kingston Emergency Food Collaborative issues a thing that they feel passionate that they're advocating for. Can the chair of LiveWell and myself decide that LiveWell wants to sign on to that, or do we need to bring that back to the larger commission? I would think you'd want to bring it back to the larger commission only in so much that not that it's a bad decision, but if someone should happen to approach us on it and we give them that like glazed look of like you're part of this commission and you don't know about it, it could kind of ruin the whole, you know, structure that has been built or the commission that has been built. Yeah, just an email. I think, that, I think that's a very valid point, Heidi. One of the things that we'll have to think about then is when something is time sensitive, since we only meet as a commission, you know, when the Mets are playing, right. the right. doctors at Chavez Ravine. Yeah. And we have to figure out a way to do this via email. Yeah, by and, proxy. I agree. And come to agreement yeah. around that. I think okay. that's a valid point. Yeah. Um, Troy and put in a question. I, I just want to pause and say, Anna, I think that's Anna Brett that is calling in, who is a commissioner. Uh, okay, thank you. It just said yeah. Anna. <laughs> if it's not Anna, if it's not Anna, feel free to introduce yourself. I'm, I'm guessing that it is. And Stacy, you wanted to say something. Um, yeah, I said just an email I think would be enough to um, keep us all in the loop and let us kind of respond yay or nay. Um, I thought that we had that process um, formalized for the other letter. So. So we never technically formalized an email voting process. So that came up as a discussion. Mm -hmm. So that technically hasn't been resolved. We could open that back up and have an, I would suggest we have, you know, just bring that discussion to next month and formalize like an email voting process. Um, okay. There was some okay. resistance to it, as I remember, but I don't think we'll have that issue. Yeah, so I, I think- I was just if, gonna say that, I, I think that um, I realize that time is always an issue with signing a letter and getting it out, but, Heaven forbid some, there is some backlash from it as the coordinator yeah. and the chair. I think you want more people on board from Backing. the commission and that protects you. Oh, absolutely. That, I, that's why I agreed immediately with Heidi about it because it does go beyond the, the glazed look of what are you talking about to then saying, really, they did that or you know yeah. whatever it is, so yes. Thank you for making that point, Melinda. Any other thoughts on that? Um, I think where we're landing is that next month we'll have uh, another discussion about an email process for voting and for you know decision making. I see some head nods, so thank you. Okay. Uh, my last thought on this um, agenda, I just wanted to inform everyone that Freddie Garcia stepped down. He's leaving his position yeah. at the Health Alliance Hospital. I know Troy Ellen, it's very sad. Yeah. He's been a great person to work with. I think it sounds like he had another opportunity. So congratulations to him. Uh, it's a loss for our community for sure. Um, so that does mean we now have two open chairs. Um, we did have some action items on previous meetings that I think that I need to follow up on. I think we had a few names that we had uh, identified and I'll, I'll go back and check where the, I'm not gonna say I dropped the ball, but I'm gonna say I'm gonna go back and find the ball and we'll follow up on those next. Um, unless someone says, 
right it, now or email me, this person would be perfect, then please send that to me and we'll follow up on it. Um, but just we, want to bring attention to that. We know what a slacker you are, Emily. No. <laughs> <laughs> are there are there any like, um, I don't even know what skill sets, but any areas, you know, yeah. that you want to um, kind of get more, have more presence? Well, we, go ahead, Emily. Emily. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to mention that we did um, have recent, somewhat recently, a pretty robust conversation about identifying people of Hispanic descent and right. Spanish speakers as a, right. as a next priority. Yeah. Um, that said, we can always have that discussion again. All right. Um, next up on the agenda is announcements and communications. Would anyone like to share some things? I'm leaving the African Root Center, or I've left actually effective last Thursday, not under bed circumstances or anything like that. I'll still be volunteering with them, but I'm no longer going to be their one staff member. And so my, my next my next adventure in my retirement is I'm joining Radio Kingston to uh, build up their, I'm not going to be on air, although people have already said to me, Jimmy's going to ask you that next. <laughs> but anyway, um, um, helping to build their underwriting uh, department so that businesses Excellent. can advertise and that Radio Kingston will be able to fuel their community fund, which they're very committed to continuing in the community. So still a part-time gig, still in Kingston, and I'm excited. So wish me luck. That's awesome. Good luck. <laughs> Good I, I luck. would love to hear more about that, that underwriting and oh yeah, uh, that's great. Huh. Hmm. Um, I just want to, wait, I just have to say this. Malia, I heard you on NPR. Did anybody hear this? You were so, it was so interesting. I had to say, I almost emailed everybody. I was, I think, driving to my office in New Paltz and it was like, wait, I recognize that voice. <laughs> so um, you can say more because I, I didn't get the beginning of it, but you were on a panel talking about Afghanistan and, and right, and kind of a response to what's happening in the country and about, you know, pulling out of troops out of Afghanistan and then your expertise yeah. of, of working there. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, WMC, you all might be familiar, like every weekday morning, they have this round table program from nine to 11. Um, and I'm now a recurring guest on that program. Uh, if my <laughs> That's great. The time I went on was um, the day before the inauguration. They wanted someone who was a veteran who had some idea of what the military situation in DC might be like. So um, that went pretty well. And I think, um, when was that that you heard? It was last, last week. I think it was last week, yeah. Time flies. Um, uh, yeah, that was my fifth or sixth time. So um, it seems like every- You are a veteran. <laughs> yeah, every, every couple of weeks they ask oh, me about it. It's great. <laughs> I've been able to, actually, I had the opportunity this past time, one of the topics was um, was vaccines. And, and I did talk about how we've been doing really well in Ulster County among the people vaccinated, so. <laughs> what was your branch of service? Army. Hmm. I worked yeah, on I the, saw, my water bottle. I, I, I worked I saw on your the, water I worked, bottle, and I, I worked about on that. the <laughs> I worked on the army account for years at NWA during the be all you can be days. Oh, and I so I traveled to army bases all over the country for oh. like twelve years. Wow, I was an army brat for the first five years of my life. Uh-huh. Another story, another time, but yeah. <laughs> huh. I have that same. You can see my same water bottle. You can't yeah. see it. Oh. Can't see it. Sorry. Malia, do, is there a regular this... time? Sorry, Malia, is there a regular time that you'll be on? I want to tune in. No, every month they do it differently. Oh, okay. Um, send out um, invitations for the entire month's worth at the beginning of the month. Um, so I, I know generally a couple of weeks in advance, but there've been a couple of times I've been on where they literally reach out the night before, you know, I guess they had a cancellation. <laughs> well, send, send out an email. Yeah, please do. I'm not used to promoting myself in that way, but, um, sure. <laughs> Thank you. 
other announcements or communications? Stacy, got anything from the health department you want us to put out? Um, I did put it in the chat that there are some uh, links to sign up for the vaccine. Uh, we are having walk-in clinics um, at the different locations and you can share that um, from our Facebook um, and social media pages as well. Um, or just have people go to vaccinateulster.com, um, regularly bookmark that site and you'll see that the fresh um, links are posted regularly for new clinics, new opportunities for walk-in centers throughout the community. So that's really the best website to check out, vaccinateulster.com. And I just wanna add something cause I'm doing participating on this. I don't know vaccine status, but as you talk to people, I've been encouraging people to sign up for the vsafe.cdc.gov. It's a check-in. Yeah, I do that, yeah. And I, and I signed up for that because I said, essentially, this is an ongoing clinical trial. And as a 60 some odd year old black woman with mild hypertension, they might wanna know what my reaction is so that they can continue to to, to monitor this. So I've been telling everybody, I've been going out like I'm their PR flack or something and telling people to, to sign up. And somebody was like, how did you find that out? I said, well, cause they gave me the sheet of paper at my first dose and they went, you read that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they just put something in my arm that didn't exist a year ago. Of course I read it, but anyway, so I would encourage others to encourage people to sign up for that tracking. Glad to hear you're doing it, Susanna. I did it for, well, I got my second vaccine in January, so I don't, I don't, um, I did it for a long time and they stopped sending it to me. Maybe after three months, I think, I don't know. I, well, I, they may have done it longer. I think, I don't know, because I just got my second oh, shot, but I yeah. know that they did it daily for the first week and then yeah. it was weekly, weekly up until again. the second shot and now it's daily again. Oh, so I'm, I'm not sure how long, but it's like, it's a series of four or five questions you answer them on your, and they send you a reminder. It's time for your check-in. It's like big brother, but I think it's worth putting my information and everybody else's into the mix. Um, it's just about 5.30 and I realized we didn't approve the minutes. Can we jump back real fast? Would anyone like to make a motion to approve March's minutes? I make a motion to approve March's minutes. I'll second. Any discussion? Hearing none. Hearing none. <laughs> we'll call the vote. All in favor say aye. aye. Or do aye. thumbs up. I see eyes. Thank you. It doesn't look, I think everyone said aye, so I'm not gonna ask about abstentions and I'm not gonna ask about again. So the did, motion passes. Did, did Anna vote? Uh I didn't see you're right. Thank you for that, Trion. Anna, did you want to vote? Are you there? So I'm gonna put her down as an abstent abstention for now. And the motion will still pass. He said yes. Oh great. In the chat. Yay. Using the you. chat. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay. The, um, then this is going to be last call for any kind of um, announcement. And then I just want to draw attention to the all the focus team events that are listed on the agenda to look at at your uh, opportunity. Okay. Thank you for running an efficient meeting, Emily. Yes. Thank I you. I appreciate tonight. you. Thank you, Troyan. I'm really sorry to have missed most of that presentation. I was waiting at the doctor's office for a long time, so sorry about that. But did he, did he break slide? Can you share the slide? Were there slides? Oh, yeah, or? it was really good. Yeah. Well, it was record. It's still recording, so let me stop the recording. Oh, on limit we have to do a motion to adjourn first. Oh, I move to adjourn. I'll Thank second. You, well, you guys are too fast. <laughs> uh, any discussion? Hearing none, call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Let's see, and Susanna, are you voting? Aye. Yeah, sorry, aye. Aye, great. Okay, and, so. And, and Anna, can you put it in the chat? I, I just have a question, and we're all leaving, but is there any talk about meetings resuming in person ever? I mean, is there a talk about that in the city or? Not a 
sorry, not officially yet, like no one is saying like you should start thinking about this, but I do want to remind the commission that as a public meeting, as New York State law as of right now, when they do make the decision, we will have to go back into person. We might be able to come up with a hybrid, like we, so that there's still a way to call in, but um, they waived that law during COVID. So technically as a public commission, we would have to be in person, okay. but it hasn't happened yet. Oh, maybe we could do Facebook oh. Live. And Doug's got his hand up. Doug, did you want to add to that? Uh, Emily and the rest of the committee, I've been taking lots of notes here. This is a very active committee. And I, what, I, what I would like to do is get on the agenda for the, for the uh, Common Council uh, Caucus on May 3rd and just give a brief overview of, I mean, there's a lot going on here. So I think the, the council would be interested in know this. So if I could just get three or four minutes of their attention, I'd like to get publicity for this. So what you all doing? It's great. Thank you, Doug. I mean, the Air Quality Initiative, the Hero Focus Team, the vaccination, uh, you know, the letters of support and so on, and all the various, seems like they got 12 subcommittees going on. I, 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 it's very, very impressive. So I, I want to be sure that the uh, council members are aware of this. I appreciate that, Doug. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I have to run. Yeah. yeah. All right. Hi, everyone. Right. Thank Bye. you so much, everyone. Have a good night. You can stop.